Welcome back, and this week we're about to finish with the Baroque. When we're talking about the Baroque, we're talking about the 1600s or the 17th century. We're talking about a movement that started in Rome in 1600, and we're seeing an arc, Renaissance, light, balance, beauty, and then things start getting a little off, right? Mannerism, you know, a lot of dead bodies, dead Christ, and then all of a sudden, you have this genius from Rome called Caravaggio, and you have the beginning of the Baroque. Baroque is a pearl with a defect, and we've seen the Baroque in Italy, we've seen the Baroque a little bit in Spain, we've seen the Baroque in the Netherlands, we've seen the Baroque, and now we want to talk about the Baroque in France, right? Because remember, France with the Gothic was the center of art, but the center moved to Italy, and eventually the center of art will go back to France after the Baroque. So basically, you know, um, the monarchies, the big patrons of the art in Europe are the monarchies, the kings, the church in Italy and the kings in France and England. And how about the Netherlands? The Netherlands are funny, right? You have merchants, you have the middle class, those are the patrons of the art. So basically, here we have two directions in Europe. You have the French and the English. And with the English, you have more representation of the people. And with the French, you have absolutism, okay? Because Louis XIV, the most powerful absolutist monarch of the world, he rules from 1643 to 1715 in France. He said, the state is mine. I am the state. L'état c'est moi. So that's Louis XIV in France. Meanwhile, in England, you have parliament. You have the, 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 the monarch doesn't have all the power. It's kind of divided amongst other people. So when we talk about the Baroque, we have these two competing political tendencies going on in Europe, the British versus the French, absolutism versus representation. And so, you know, let's go to, um, to France. Let's go to France, and France is competing with Rome. France wants to be more important than Rome. And, you know, just like Rome used art during the Baroque to sort of fight the propaganda war for religion, now France uses the Baroque in France to fight a propaganda war for monarchy. The Baroque is the way for the king to say, I am the biggest and the best. And this is a time when they're using the word classic a lot. The French are using the classic. What does classic mean? And we use classic. Hey, that's a classic shirt. Hey, that's a classic uh, uh, tune. Hey, that's a classic program. Well, during the Baroque time in France, classic means the highest achievement, the most, the best, okay? Classic also can mean that it imitates the gods and goddesses and the naked men of the Greeks and the Romans. And classic also means balance and restraint. Both mean classic at the time of this, of this, of this era. But let's look at some Baroque art from France. Look at Georges Latour. It's all light and dark, almost like Caravaggio. It's like tenebrism. Okay, look at the peasant family from this era in this Baroque painting. Look at the poverty-stricken peasants. Or maybe this is actually a well-to-do family. But what a difference from the Netherlands. The Netherlands, they have hard floors. The Netherlands, they have windows. So, but that's the toll. That's the price of having an absolutist monarch and not having a more um, equal society. And here you have, you know, when we're talking about the Baroque in, in, um, in France, you have the classic influence. And the classic influence comes through Nicolas Poussin. Nicolas Poussin was French, but he was always in Rome. He lived in Rome. He was like the French ambassador in Rome. And everyone that went to Rome from France would go visit Poussin, see his studio, and bring some paintings. And so he is very classical. He is very classical, and he is the model, the poster boy of artists in France at this time. So even though it's Baroque, 
It's also classic. It's very funny. No category is a catch-all, all right? So we have Poussin. And you know, Poussin is working in history paintings. Look at this, the abduction of the Sabines. A bunch of Roman men went to get women from a neighborhood village and they destroyed uh, the village, brought the women, sequestered the women, um, and this is that picture. But look how clean, how clear the mess is depicted. One of the very famous pictures in our history, the abduction of the Sabine women, 1633. And just so you uh, <clears throat> get a sense, this is Louis XIV, right? Look at the hair, the wig, look at the high heel, blue eye, blue eye. Mm -mm. Oh no, this is a great absolutist monarch. At the peak of his power, he establishes the Royal Academy an art school, the model of the art school for all the art schools, and it's really to promote himself, to promote the monarchy. And you can see him there with his wigs and his talcum and his deodorant. And the guy that would run the academy for him was a painter, a guy called Charles Lebrun. This is Lebrun, and this is a picture that Lebrun did of Louis XIV. And of course, it was at this time, it was at this time that Louis XIV decided to expand on a great palace that he had in Versailles. And that's how we have, from 1668, between 1668 uh, and 1670, the enhancement of a previously constructed palace that now becomes Versailles, okay? The great palace of Versailles. So this is also during the Baroque. Charles Lebrun, the director of the Royal Academy, uh, from 48, does a lot of murals. Look at the mirrors. Okay, this is the kind of expenditure, this is the kind of luxury that's gonna cost what? The French Revolution. The, the grandson of this guy is gonna be killed by the people under the guillotine. And so, you know, this is what happens. Um, Versailles, Versailles, the gardens of Versailles, were splendid. They were done by André Lenotre. You can visit Versailles today. It's a, it's a, it's like the Summer Palace in China. You know, when you go to the Summer Palace. Um, so, you know, that is the Baroque. That is the Baroque. And I haven't talked so much about the British painters. Uh, I don't. There's not so many I, I like. But I would like to go on before we finish with the Baroque to say that then the Baroque. At the tail end of the 1600, the beginning of the 1700, the Baroque changes, right? And it becomes Rococo, Rococo. Rococo is like a playful and irregular Baroque. It's, it's a Baroque that has to do more with, um, with little parties of the aristocracy in the countryside a little bit with theater, you know. So the Baroque is grand and Rococo is intimate. And let me show you, let me show you some pictures from the Rococo. Uh, again, early 1700, Watteau. See, it's like theatrical. Boucher, look at this Rococo, look at the women bathing, Venus bathing, Odalisk, you know, the lovers of the nobles. Um, and of course, Fragonard. Okay, look at the swing, classic Rococo. Um, and with that, I will stop my presentation on the Rococo we'll f and the Baroque. We will finish this week and get ready because next week is going to be incredible as we are going to go into the Americas, the art of the Americas. Um, thank you.